But yeah, so I don't know, Pastor Josh, did you want to be, were you intending to be a little more interactive or? Did yes, you yes, I do. And so, um, you know, I wanted to see if we can make use of the chat box uh, as well. But um, if you do have, um, actually, uh, everyone knows how to use their, their little, um, uh, their, uh, their, their little, their little thumb, right? You can, you can raise a thumb or, or you can, you can clap or, and, and so if, if anyone has, a, I think there's a, a raise your hand feature, right? You can raise your hand. Um, and uh, if you've got a question or anything, um, would love to take questions and make this a little bit more interactive. Um, I know that, wow, there's actually quite a number of people. I didn't expect it to be so big, but a youth group in, at, at Living Water is 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 sizable um let me just share a little bit more about me and um my time uh, especially at living water you know when right, we're not pastor josh uh, oh yeah Joe, can you make uh pastor josh co-host because you have a presentation right you want to share i'm assuming uh actually i decided not to do slides and stuff just to keep it more like this so so uh I'll talk through a few things uh, and then just leave it open for questions and uh, some interaction, I hope. So every time that uh, I come to uh, work workshops, um, sometimes that word workshop is a little bit of a misnomer because um, it, it's not as interactive and it tends to be like real, a lot of theory and everything up in the sky kind of talking and um, I, I really hope that this would be much more practical and down to earth. Um, so I will share like, um, I'll share a little bit about myself and then I'll, uh, I'll bring up um, what, what we're going to be talking about this morning. And, um, and then again, if you already have like burning questions that you'd like to pose, um, uh, go ahead and like raise your hand or throw it in the chat or whatever you want. All right. Um, I'll start with a word of prayer real quick, if you don't mind. Let's pray. And Andy is right. I still do pray with my eyes open. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you for a glorious Saturday morning to be able to come together and um, find a place of community. Lord, we pray for just the space uh, of a workshop. Um, to talk about what it means to walk with you in, in, for a lifetime. Um, uh, Lord, we pray that you would um, give us safety and comfort to be able to voice that uh, it wouldn't just be one talking head, um, but rather there would be an interaction. There would be a space where we can be genuine and authentic um, and even bring up things that are hard. Um, Lord, would you be in this space with us? Um, would you lead our conversation? So we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so to share a little bit more about me, I was actually, uh, I, I was a little bit older when I got to Living Water. Back then it was called uh, Chinese Christian Mandarin Church, which still exists, I think. Um, uh, and... Um, and Living Water was just what they called a gospel center. And um, the hope was to merge the two churches together um, later on. Uh, I didn't know what I was getting myself self into when I showed up at uh, in, in the Chicago area, in Naperville and Downers Grove. And, um, and the youth group there was pretty big. Um, I think the, the, the youth group spanned, we had like, uh, eight different high schools and a whole bunch more uh, different junior highs um, where people went. Um, it went all the way, um, all the way from uh, uh, Clarendon Hills all the way down to uh, Aurora, um, and it made it really challenging to connect in community. Um, but somehow we made it work, uh, and it, it was a humbling place. Uh, at that time also, I think that it worked because, uh, not because of anything that I did, I inherited 
uh, just an, an incredible leadership team, uh, which all included Ronnie, um, uh, Ronnie Wu, or yeah, Ronnie Wu back then was Ra Ronnie Chow, um, uh, was one of the leaders. And I got to work with uh, this group of phenomenal leaders who poured themselves out into a youth group. And so our youth group actually grew and kind of grew out of hand. Um, our, our camps were too big, our, our Friday nights, um, just we separated high school and junior high eventually. And uh, our high schooler uh, uh, met in one location, our junior high met in another location. I think all total, it was like 140 teens or something like that. Um, and it was getting a little unwieldy and we were always looking for leaders. Um, and, and the thing about leaders is leaders are some, leaders are made. Um, they're not, they're not, they're not just born as a leader. Leaders are something that um, is cultivated and grown. Um, and what it means to be a leader in a, a church is someone who has learned to take ownership of their faith, um, someone who has an authentic walking relationship with God. Um, there are a lot of people who really wanted to be a leader, but um, uh, the ones that we called to be leaders, they, I, I, I like to use the, the phrase, um, they, they were adulting. Um, they were spiritually adulting. And that's kind of like, that's kind of what I wanna talk about this morning. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that term adulting before, uh, adulting is uh, actually classes now, especially for your generation. Generation, are you guys Generation Z? Generation, what what do they call it now? Yeah, um, uh, there are actually classes in undergrad at different colleges um, called Adulting 101, and they cover things like, oh, uh, how do you open a bank account? How do you manage uh, your finances? How do you how do you clip coupons, right? Uh, how do you do your taxes? How do you how do you save? Uh, how do you how do you get uh, how do you rent an apartment? How do you uh, get renters insurance? How do you um, how do you apply for a job? How do you interview for a job? Uh, how do you iron your clothes? How do you cook and how do you bake and how do you make the bed? And that that's actually one of the topics in this class is how to make your bed. Um, and essentially, the class is just how do you be a uh, responsible human being, right? I think the same is true for, for our spiritual life, um, that there needs to be some growth or, you know, you could use the term adulting. Um, what does it mean to grow into this thing called faith? And one of the, the biggest struggles that I remember uh, uh, I had as a youth director at, at, um, at Living Water uh, back then, it was called something different. Um, but I think it still holds true today is that for a lot of the vast majority of, um, of the youth group, they came to church and they came into faith because of family, um, because their parents brought them. Uh, and there were a few individuals that, that were unique. They came on their own. Actually, I think uh, uh, and Andy's wife, Sandra, was one of them. Uh, she just came on her own. Her, her parents really um, uh, weren't the ones that brought her to, to uh, a church community, weren't the ones who uh, brought her to faith. Um, but for the vast majority, uh, you know, we, we called ourselves, including myself, uh, we, we called ourselves church kids. Um, we grew up in the church and, and uh, faith was something that was more of a family thing. Uh, and one of the struggles with that is that uh, faith really isn't my own. Um, when I was growing up, my, I went to church because my parents brought me. Um, I was involved in church because my parents were involved in church. Uh, I, I, I came to know uh, all the stories in the Bible because I was in the Sunday school classes and I was, uh, I went to uh, Sunday service and I would sing the songs and, and, and I would do the Bible memory competitions and, and, and all of those things. And it gave me a, a background of knowledge about God. But when it came to actually knowing God, 
Um, that was something that uh, came a lot later and it required some adulting and it required some growing up, some, some coming into an ownership of what faith meant in my life. And so um, that was a, a slow process, definitely. Um, it, it meant figuring out, okay, is God real or not? Is he, is he really genuinely in my life? Uh, the thing is, though, a lot of people think that, oh, well, that happens way later. You know, after you head off on your own into undergrad or, or, or uh, you, you finish college and you start working and, and that's when you can really own your faith. And I don't think that's true at all. Uh, that wasn't an experience for me and that wasn't the experience for the vast majority of um, the, the, the youth I got to work with. Um, you know, walking with our teens, even our seventh and eighth graders, um, there, there is a capacity for such maturity and critical thought and insight. Um, and, and before long, like, you know, we had a lot of teens who acted like responsible human beings. More than that, there was an ownership of their faith. With that ownership of the faith, they, um, they really started to adult. Um, and, and, you know, I guess I will share, share my screen. Um, let me, let me bring up, uh, I, I just want to read a passage that I think, uh, has everything to do with adulting. Um, if I can, uh, get it up on the screen here and get the right translation. Uh, I'm going to read out of uh, Genesis, uh, Galatians, not Genesis. I've been talking about Genesis a lot. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Um, and I'm going to read out of the, uh, the, the message translation. Uh, I, I like this translation a lot. And so um, I'll read so that you, you guys can just kind of follow along. Let me see if I can make the font a little bit bigger. Where is that? And it needs to be bigger than that. All right. And I'm going to, there we go. I'm going to start right here in verse 13 of Galatians. And again, this is the, the message translation and it, just says that it's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time, you'll be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feel the, feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there's a root of sinful self-interest in us, in us all. That's at, at odds with the free spirit. Just as the free spirit is completely incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. So why don't you choose to be led by the spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? Um, it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. You know, when you do, it's repetitive, it's loveless, there's cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on. 
And this isn't the first time I've warned you, you know, if you use your freedom this way, you won't inherit the God, God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others or love, exuberance about life or joy, serenity or peace. We develop a willingness to stick with things, patience, a sense of compassion in the heart, or kindness, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. Um, that's self-control. Somewhere in there, gentleness is. Um, so... I just wanted to, to read that just uh, as kind of a start for our conversation of um, what it means to adult in, in your spiritual life. Um, so I think adulting uh, it takes on a, a lot of these characteristics that, that we need. Um, uh, one of the things I want to point out in this passage, uh, you know, the, the writer, Apostle Paul, and the translator actually uh, uses the imagery of... Uh, fruit that comes from a tree or an orchard. Um, and, and, and the thing about the fruit of our lives, it, it's, I think it's kind of like a litmus test. You know, it shows the evidence of what's going on inside. Um, uh, when there is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control, like, uh, oh, faithfulness. I, I always forget faithfulness. Um, that those are things that uh, come because, because something else is happening inside you. Um, come because you are experiencing freedom, but that freedom is submitted under what God um, kind of creates in terms of the boundaries of uh, our lives of freedom. And when, when we get to enjoy that freedom within God's boundaries, uh, that's, that's when all these things get produced. Um, uh, that that's the, the the result of it is I think adulting in in our Christian life. Um, it means that there's self control uh, in our life. There, it means that we approach uh, people and everything around us with uh, humility. Um, it means that uh, we're able to accept uncertainty because we have a, a security with a relationship with our God that goes far beyond the circumstances that we're in. We don't get stressed out and freaked out about tests or exams or a fight with a friend or uh, uh, pressure from even parents. Um, we're able to find, uh, we're able to find an anchor even in the face of failure. Um, you know, I think we have this culture, especially coming from an Asian background, where uh, it, it's, it's somehow communicated that it's unacceptable to fail. I think that really, that really hurts us in terms of growing up in, in Christ. Um, when, when we accept that failure is a part of life, it allow, and, and just, just a part of our our process and experience. Um, it, it means that we can take risks and be okay with failure because failure means that there's something to be learned. There's something to, to grow from rather than just always performing at this certain level and, and, and achieving. You know, if you, if you look in the Bible um, and you look at every single character in the Bible, every single person that's um, presented in, in Scripture, especially all of the heroes of the faith. Other than Jesus, they were all utter failures at, at some point in their life. But somehow, especially, especially in Naperville, and I don't know if you guys are all from Naperville uh, uh, or Aurora, are you guys 203, 204 schools, right? Yes, I see a couple of nods, only of the people that I can see. But, um, you know, the, the expectation in, in these schools is that, man, you, you're, you're going to be uh, excellent all of the time. And that's a lot of pressure. Um, but to accept that, you know, failure doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. In fact, remember 
message from a couple of nights ago, we're all created good. And that's the starting point. That's the basis. We are good. And failure just means that there's more to learn. There's more to grow. And so it's okay to fail at things so that we would always try, and especially to try new things, try things that we're not uh, very good at. So anyway, I can keep going on about that, but I'm going <laughs> to, uh, I'll get, I'll get, I get distracted very easily. That's one thing that Andy didn't share. Uh, I, I can get really distracted and, and caught up in, 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 in talking about certain things. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that, um, uh, what it means to, to, uh, to, to adult in your faith uh, is learning delayed gratification. Uh, if you know anything about delayed gratification, it means that, you know, you're, you're not all about instant um, satisfaction, right? Uh, we have a very instant society. You can go right now into your kitchen, pop something in the microwave, and within one minute, you have something delicious to eat, like a Hot Pocket and everything. I love Hot Pockets. Uh, you can uh, immediately head into a restaurant or even uh, you can drive through. You, can, you don't even have to get out of your car. You can drive through a restaurant and order all this food and it, it shows up in an instant, right? You, if you want to, to be entertained and you want to watch something, you can turn on your television and you can instantly stream whatever you want. And, and I think uh, what, what that begins to do in our brains is wire us to want instant satisfaction. Um, but I think what it, one of the things that it means to grow up in our faith to that some of the best things in life that are worth it uh, are worth waiting for to delay that gratification. It's kind of like, um, uh, have, you ever, have you guys ever heard of this experiment? experiment? It, it happened in the late 60s. Um, and, and they would bring two-year-olds into a room and, and, and they, would, um, they would put a, a, a piece of candy, a, a piece of chocolate right in the middle of the table. And, and the adults in the room would say, um, oh, you know what? I have, I have uh, someone else I need to talk to. Uh, can you stay right here in this room for a moment? Um, and, and, and you can have this candy, but, but um, if you wait until I get back, uh, I'll actually give you two pieces of candy. And, and so... Um, so the adult leaves, and then, of course, they're watching through this window what would happen. And the two-year-old, you know, they'll, they'll look at the, the piece of chocolate. They'll, like, sniff the piece of chocolate. Like, some of them even lick the piece of chocolate. And, and, and some of them, they, they just can't help it. They, they take that piece of chocolate, they pop it in their mouth, and, and they, they just need that instant uh, satisfaction. But what they learned was that um, some of the kids were actually able to wait they, they would sit and wait patiently. And, and you could see like, like almost, uh, um, almost kind of like when, when I make, a, we have a dog and, 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 and I, I would make her wait to eat and she would like be all like nervous and, and shaking with, with such anticipation. But, but some of these kids, they could hold themselves back from eating that piece of chocolate until the adult came back. And, and the adults would kind of, uh, time how long and some of these kids could could wait for up to 15 minutes um just sitting there with a, a piece of chocolate and, and so the adult would come back and then give them two pieces of chocolate instead of one um uh, you know the experiment was done with marshmallows and, and a lot of different things what they did was they then tracked these kids over the course of time and they tracked them actually for 20 years and those kids that could learn delayed gratification, uh, they, they actually knew how to hold themselves back. What, um, what the study set, showed was that in life, um, it showed them to be so much more successful. They knew how, what it meant to, to, to save and to, so that they could save for, for something that is a lot more valuable. They, they, they learn that even in friendship and relationships, that, that these, these individuals who learn de delayed gratification, uh, they were a lot more successful in their relationships, in their, in their families, in their marriage relationships. Um, and so I think 
the same applies in uh, the Christian life as well. Um, all right, I'm going to pause right here. Um, so you don't have to offer questions about what I've just talked about, but I would love to hear from all of you guys if if there are any burning questions that that um, you'd like to you'd like to you'd like to chat about. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going and going and going and going. So I'm going to put a pause right here because we're already like half an hour in and everything. What what are some questions that um, are burning in your heart that you would love to talk about, hear, um, hear about, uh, hear me like pitch things back to Pastor Barry to answer because I, I really don't know. No, nothing. And Zoom is such a odd like context for this to happen. I know, but uh, I'd love to hear from all of you guys. What What are some things that you're curious about? Um, what are th some things that you're 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 struggling with? Um, and I know that it's hard to keep anonymity on zoom. So I hope you feel okay. You know, that this is a safe place to, to have interaction. Hey, uh, sorry. I just realized the chat is, uh, probably, oh, oh, the chat yeah. turned like off. In, uh, <laughs> what about in like, like a circumstance now, like being thrown into a pandemic and a shelter in place where, is not given time to develop that and, and all, all that you're talking about. Like, how do you manage to do that or, or navigate through at least the adulting and being thrown into them? Yeah, that, that's a great point. Like, uh, that's a great, in, in the midst of this pandemic, you know, we are spending more time isolated and alone than we ever have, which uh, honestly, it worries me because uh, we are designed to be relational people, right? But what what's happened is our relationships have kind of gotten reduced down to video or or texting and, and uh, emailing or uh, there's not really a lot of interaction, face to face interaction. Um, and you might think, oh, well, that's no big deal, but so much of connection and relationship has to do with face-to-face uh, -face interaction. You know, I, as a, as a student, um, when I was in undergrad, uh, there, was, there was a course that I was taking and, and uh, they talked about how communication, it, it's, only, it, it's only about 10% verbal, right? So if you're texting people, it's like 100% verbal, unless you're like, your emoji game is like on point or something like emoji, emoji, emoji. But, but pretty much all we're doing is just we're just um, being verbal um, but that 90 percent of real communication happens uh, outside of the of the actual words that you're saying it has to do with tone it has to do with um, body posture it has to do it's all this nonverbal communication that we offer each other and it's so important and because of the pandemic we've cut out a lot of that and I bring this up because so much of what it means to adult in Christ to grow up in Christ is um, has to do with our interactions with others um, here let me let me let me phrase it this way um, fruit the fruit of a tree is never actually for the tree right you know when when fruit of a bush like a strawberry bush uh, or, or raspberry bush. It, it never drops down in order to feed the tree. And so if you think about that list in Galatians chapter 5, you know, uh, this, this list of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, like all of those things don't actually have to do with us. It's not for our benefit. It's actually for other people's benefit. The fruit that's produced in our lives is for the interaction that we have with the world around us. And if we don't have that, those healthy interactions, then um, there's no way for, for that fruit to be exp expressed. And there's no way to, to really press, oh, man, uh, I, I see that, 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 that I, I am really impatient. And 
a lot of times people think, oh, I, I, I'm impatient, and so I've got to really work on patience. Um, that's not the point. Fruit is produced from something inside. And so if there's not patience in your life, uh, it's a sign. It's a litmus test. It's a sign that there's something else deeper going on inside. All right, so uh, I'm going to keep going with, with questions. Any specific advice for seniors heading off for, to college for the first time? Well, it kind of plays in line with um, what I'm talking about. I think it's so important to connect with others and to build a community around you, especially uh, to build a community like, like what we mentioned last night, uh, a place where you can be completely you, authentic, real, genuine, and don't and, and you, you don't feel shame. These are people who really know, uh, know you and you know them. Uh, people who know your, your weaknesses, people who know your, your brokenness, people who know uh, what, what messed up things are going on, people who you can share those stories with so that they can journey with you. And I wanna encourage you that I hope that those people would have the same trajectory as you do in your life. What, what I mean by that is I think we orient ourselves towards different things, right? Some people orient themselves towards, I want this career because my dream is wanting a house. Uh, I'm wanting multiple houses, one in uh, up, upstate New York, one in Wisconsin, one in downtown Chicago. And, and, and so I'm going to get a job that's going to be able to, to pay for all of those luxuries. And, and eventually I want to I want to have a wife and two and a half kids because uh, uh, my wife is always going to be pregnant. We're going to have a cat and maybe two cats and, 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 and maybe a parakeet. And, and I'll get a, a three-car garage because I don't need three cars, but I want two-car garage and, and that way I can keep my toys in, in that. And that's the trajectory of their lives, right? But if, if all of us, we really, we have this genuine ownership of a relationship with Jesus, with a God who, who breathes life into us, who, who crafted and created us. Um, if we have, a, uh, if that is the trajectory of our lives, if we orient our lives around him, then we're headed in a different direction than uh, someone who had, who, who wants all the, the house, the two and a half kids and, and everything, right? But if we we're surrounding ourselves with these kind of people, or we're surrounding ourselves with people who are all about instant gratification, or we're surrounding ourselves with people who are, 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 are only interested in, in, in selfishness and in selfish things, you know, that, then if that's the community, if that, those are the people that we feel safest with, they begin to shape us and mold us. Um, and that, that becomes really unhealthy. Uh, so I want to encourage you, you know, uh, I think that would be my top advice for college. It's not about academics or grades or, or anything like that. It's not about study habits or living on your own. And you can take the Adulting 101 class if your college offers that. But I think more than anything is finding a community to connect with, especially a community that's, that ha shares the same values, that, that, that are heading in the same trajectory. Um, so that you can travel together, you can you can walk together in that that trajectory. Um, what awaits in college? I'm not quite sure. Are there some some practical steps to to, to take um, in terms of heading to college, preparing for college? It, uh, if you can give me a little bit more specifics, I, I'd love to field that. Um, Another question says, uh, what steps could a large community like ours take towards uh, creating an environment like you described? Um, I, I think that's a, an excellent question. You know, it, I think Jesus actually models this uh, so beautifully in scripture, right? So in, in Jesus's life, uh, he served the masses. There is a huge following around him. Every time he showed up in a town, crowds, it says like crowds upon crowds would gather around him. You know, one time he's teaching and they counted five, uh, 5,000 men, right? Uh, only the guys, not including any of the women and children. And, and, and so he, he was just surrounded by crowds. But 
out of those crowds, there were uh, there were there were a group of people who he he who really followed him, um, who were much closer. Like they they actually um, they weren't there for the spectacle. They were there really interested in what he had to say. Um, and then out of that, those that followed him, there was actually a, a, a smaller group that uh, of people who he called disciples. Um, actually, in one, one place in the Gospels, it says that there were 72. And out of the, that 72, there were actually only 12 that he called specifically to follow him. And we know them as the apostles, the disciples, the 12. And out of that 12... There are actually three of them, Peter, James, and John, who saw things that the other 12 didn't get to see. Um, and so in, it invited them like up onto the mountaintop and, and, and he, he, Jesus was transfigured and they were the only ones who got to see. Um, there were healings where, where he was bringing a little girl back, back to life and he only invited to come into the room uh, to, to see it. And, and there's a sense that um, there's there are these concentric circles. It doesn't mean that intimacy is any any less, but that there are certain people who uh, are that are called closer to you um, to be that safe community. Uh, and so I encourage that model. You know, um, I'm sure, all of you guys can think of a couple of friends who. And they are your closest friends. Uh, they are that trusted community. And I wonder if those, those, that group of people really, like, are you safe with those two or three people to actually talk about weaknesses, of failures, of struggles, of wrestling, of maybe even sin? One of the commands, especially in the New Testament, over and over and over again, but it even exists in the Old Testament, and we'll actually talk about it on, on Sunday morning, um, is the command that we confess our sins to one another. Um, book of James, book of Hebrew, like it, 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 it talks about this a lot, that we are actually supposed to talk about sin with each other, the things that we struggle most with. But oftentimes, especially Asians, because oh, I'm Asian, I'm Chinese, uh, I know this. Like, I am so filled with shame. I don't want anyone to know what sin I struggle with. Um, but then to have a context of safety where you can actually talk about these things is incredible. And what I found is when I, found, fought, when I have found those places they're they're healing they breathe life into me and all of a sudden the, these are companions that walk not that they have any solutions towards the sin struggles that i have but that they walk with me in it we don't wallow in sin together instead we encourage each other and we accept each other and we we we're, we're we press each other to deal with the mess that we have in our lives okay so I could go on and on, but um, I'm going to keep going. Um, another college-related uh, question. Any advice about finding a church community at college? That's a great one. So it, it brings up something that um, uh, I think is so important in terms of what it means to adults in your spiritual life. Um, in our world, in your life, in my life, for the last... 40, oh my gosh, I, so I just turned 48, um, so I'm old, man. Not as old as Barry, but I'm old. Uh, and um, for the last 48 years of my life, especially here in the U.S., everything, everything encourages me and orients me towards consumerism, right? Everything is pushing me to buy things, right? There's advertising, marketing. Some, some of the adults in, in, in this church community um, probably are marketing you know, specialists. That's what they do for their jobs. Like it, it's to, to, to get people to purchase, to consume, to, to buy whatever it is, of whatever product, whatever service it is. We are oriented in our world so much towards consumerism. 
And I think that oftentimes we bring that into our spiritual life as well. And what, what spiritual consumerism looks like is that you show up in a place for yourself, right? You go to a church because, oh man, he, this is such a great speaker and, and, and he's so funny and witty and, 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 and so I like to hear this speaker. Or you go to this church because, oh man, they use so much multimedia and, and, and they, have, they have lights and, and, and they show videos and there's a fog machine and everything. Yeah. Yes, some churches actually use fog machines. Um, or, or I'm going to go to this church because, oh, I love their music. Their, their music is so good. It, it's, 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 you know, they dim all the lights. You can't see a thing. You can't see the person next to you, but you can see the band, and they're all lit up and everything. And, and, and it's, like a, it's like a concert that you go to more so than a worship space. And again and again, I think that uh, so much of uh, spiritual life get, gets, gets twisted into consumerism, where it's, uh, you, you start to pick and choose at things. Some people approach spiritual life like a spiritual buffet, right? If you, I, I know we're in coronavirus, they shut down all the buffets, but, but um, if you think about a buffet, you go to a buffet, uh, especially a really good buffet. There used to be a really great buffet out in Aurora, like uh, uh, at, at, out by the mall, but I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, and we would just gorge ourselves. Um, um, but some of these buffets, you, when you go to them, all you do is you pick your favorite foods, right? You go and, oh my gosh, they're, they're serving meat. Or, or I, I used to go to this uh, Korean barbecue buffet. Oh, Korean barbecue. And, and so I would load up on kalbi. Right, because because man, the ribs uh, that they, they're so tender and juicy and, and and delicious, and they're 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 marinated, and so I would ignore all of things. Chicken, I'll get a little bit just to have that flavor, but but I'm not interested. I want the call beef, right? I, I want I want I want this meat, and so I would pile up on it. And at a buffet, you just pick and choose what you want, and a lot of people they treat their spiritual life that way. Right. They go around and, oh, I'm going to get a sermon from this place and I'm going to go go get music from this place. And, and, and I'm going to be a part of that a small group because they're, they're pretty cool people. But I'm not going to go to their church or their worship service. I, instead, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over here and over there for for different things. And before long, you know, you're not really a part of anything. And that's not what church is about. Church is a place where you learn to serve. I think I, I mentioned this last night. You know, the, the, the word worship is actually uh, often translated as the word serve. That's why we have a worship service. Church is a place where you give, not a place where you get. And that's, I think, a, a huge distinction that, I think, should be the driving force of finding a place um, to finding a church community when you head off to, to undergrad. Where is a place where you can be where, one, you can find a community, people who are in the same trajectory as you, but two, you can offer your gifts, not to be spent like, okay, so uh, I want to caveat this. So there are definitely churches that are in huge need. I, when when I was an undergrad, actually, even today, there are churches that say, "Oh, Josh, Josh, come, come, be at this, be at our church because you can serve here, and, and we so desperately need you." I don't think that that's great motivation for you to be at a church because eventually, you you know that that kind of church and that kind of place is going to bleed you dry. I, I mentioned this last night. Um, God doesn't need you to serve. God wants you. God invites you to serve alongside of him, right? Um, and so if you're in a place where all you're doing is serving and, and pouring yourself out and you're giving yourself, you're giving your time, your energy, your focus and everything, and you're not really feeling a fulfillment in it, it's the wrong place to be. So, and, and by the way, there are plenty of those churches, and I confess that a lot of them tend to be Chinese churches, Um but instead, to find a place where there are people around who you can connect with deeply, find intimacy with, and a place where you can give. Um, you know, our Christian life isn't about consuming, but it's about giving. 
Uh, and actually, God is the model of that, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and, and that's, that's the, the model of what it means to really be uh, a walking Christian. Okay, I got, I got to keep going. Um, uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight in terms of finding a church. It's a lot more complicated than that, I know. Uh, and so what I would encourage you to do is uh, talk with your small group leader or talk with an older, uh, someone older in, 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 in this church community and ask them more questions about the church. Um, it, yes, it's okay to church hop for a season, for a short season, I hope, just to see are there places that I can connect. But I hope it's not about I, I, the message is boring here or, or oh, the music is kind of lame over here. Uh, it's not as good as like Andy Chung and, and everything. Like they, I want a place where, where I can find music like Andy's doing art. But instead that it's a place, wow, do I find like I can belong here? Do I find that I can have companions and, and, and people to walk with? Maybe even belong because there are some older people that really accept me and embrace me. Um, not just peers, but, but there are others. And, is this the place that I can pour myself out? Sir, maybe I love art and I love um, to express myself in, 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 in beautiful aesthetic ways. And that this is a church where you can offer that to the church. Maybe um, it, it's a place where, um, so when I was in Chicago, okay, I know I'm getting, I'm getting distracted a little bit, but let me uh, share this story. Um, so when I was in Chicago, I really got into cars. We, we would, we, I, I, there was a guy in the church who was really into cars, Mike Huang. Uh, I don't know if he shows up anymore. Um, but between he and I, we started really getting in and, and getting into repairing cars and fixing cars and everything. Uh, of course, Mike, he really wanted to soup up his car, right? He wanted to rice up his car. Uh, he wanted to lower it. He wanted a new exhaust. He wanted, you know, all the fancy things. He didn't do the lights because he thought it was like lame, but, but he wanted to, he, he wanted a faster car, right? He had a nice little Honda Civic. And so we would work on the car and eventually like we started, we started what we called car day. There was a bunch of us that really liked to work on cars. We brought everyone in uh, for car day and we would work on our cars. And for some, some people, like they would bring their car in because they've never changed their own oil before. And so we would like change the oil and everything. Or some people wanted to soup up their car. And so we would soup up their car, put on a new exhaust or, or um, but eventually it was a place of serving, at least for a few of us. Because there were some guys who wouldn't step foot into a church at all. But they would come to car day. And so we got to interact with them. And actually, I got to interact with one of them. Um, he, his name was also Josh. Um, and, and just got to talk with him and walk with him and, 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 and talk about God and talk about family, which was really messed up. And um, that was a place of serving. And we happened to be at a church where we could do something like that, where, where even our interest in, in cars was a way, a platform to be able to give, uh, to love people, to serve, to offer love and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. All right. I speak, you spoke on failure. What would you say um, to people who think they've never failed and therefore don't understand what you're talking about in regards uh, to failure being up? opportunities to learn. Woo, that's a hard one. Um, I think at the heart of this question is, um, is emotional intelligence, right? It's how do we interact with people um, who may not hold the same values as us? Um, you know, they, they might be, there might be an arrogance in their life. Um, or there, 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 there might be uh, struggles of insecurity of their lives, and that, that's why they project, oh, I, I never fail. Or, you know, there's all kinds of things, and, and how we interact with them is so important. Um, and I think that Galatians, Galatians 5 gives us a lot of insight for that, right? Um, that the first thing is all about love. Um, loving this person even in spite of their messed up 
stuff in their lives. And I do have to admit, loving arrogant people is really hard. Um, right now, in uh, I, I'm involved with a school board here in uh, in Colorado. I, I sit on my kids' neighborhood school board, um, and, and so I work with some of the staff. And there's one staff in the school. Um, she, we, we agree that she at heart is a narcissist. Um, she likes to, likes to self promote, likes to make herself look good. And she, um, she takes credit for other people's work. Um, and she, whenever something goes wrong, she immediately blames other people. I'm sure you, you, you all know people like this. And what I could do is I could choose like, oh, well, I don't like this person, so I'm not going to work with them. And I can just walk away. Eh, that's, that's one choice you could do. Or you could, I could come and approach this person and, and just be combative against them all the time. Like try to knock down their, their, their narcissism and arrogance or, or try to confront them all over and over and over again. But I think that... Um, I think scripture is right. You know, there's a, there's a passage in Romans that um, the Apostle Paul is actually quoting the Old Testament. And, and he, what he says is, you know, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. God's loving kindness, God's love and grace and, 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 and patience and steadfastness and faithfulness that leads us to kindness. I think that that's the work of God, right? God is the one that changes hearts, but I think that that's a model for me too. That as I interact, that I carry all of the grace and all of the love and all of the, the patience and goodness that God has put into me and I offer it to this person, even though they don't deserve it. And that's hard. It's incredibly hard. Um, but I don't do that just because I'm a nice guy. I do that with the hopes that it would it would spark some something in this person. I, I think there's a proverb. Um, I know there's a proverb uh, that actually says, you know, kindness to an enemy is like heaping hot coals into their, their lap, which which is a hilarious imagery. Um, you know, I think that we need to figure out how to how to carry kindness and goodness and gentleness to people especially like this usually what i realize is uh people who are arrogant people who are prideful people who are narcissistic people who uh you know have all of these struggles they're usually the most insecure people they're usually the most broken people inside they just haven't had anyone trustworthy enough to actually be honest and vulnerable around and so I want to encourage that. Um, it's not perfect. Um, it's not. It's not the solution or the answer. But I think it's it's an approach. Um, sometimes you have in, in order to really be kind and loving uh, to this person um, means to take a, a very hard boundary to say, hey, this is the boundary that, and and you keep crossing over that boundary, and, and you're not supposed to. And so I'm going to keep and hold that, that boundary. I think people often call it tough love. Right? It's love, but in the form of a hard boundary, because you know that that is the best thing for them, and that's love. So I don't know if that helps give you insight. Um, let me add one last thing. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that um, changing people's hearts, it's, it's really, it is God's work. Right, And the best way that I can partner, the best way that I can uh, co-create with God is to pray for them, to talk to God about this person, and to do it consistent. So um, there was uh, one time that I was at a retreat like this, and I was given like this little red st sticker, a little red dot. And um, the speaker encouraged me, okay, uh, that dot, assign it to someone, someone that you just want to pray for.
and stick it somewhere where you'll see it. So back then I, I carried a wallet and so I stuck it on my wallet. If I, I were to do it today, I would probably put it on my phone because you know I carry my phone everywhere more than my wallet. And, 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 and what he encouraged was every time you see that dot, pray for this, this friend. And I realized like that, that changes a heart, that changes a life more so than anything else. Yes, as much as for the person who I'm working with or dealing with, but it also changes my heart because I'm having to submit myself to a God who really knows how to do life better than I do, who really calls me to these things like love and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. So, so, so when I pray, like maybe, Maybe more of these things would be produced out of my life, especially when I interact with this person. So the encouragement is um, prayer. Uh, I think we have, do we have time for one more question? I know we're at 10, uh, uh, 11 o'clock. Um, I'm just going to field this last question. How can parents and adult leaders become the miracle girl for the youth in, in their adulting process? That is great. Um, this is something both for the adults and for the youth. I think that for all of us in our lives, we need role models. Um, and so no matter how old you are, if you are, if you're 13 or if you're 43 or 63, uh, we all need role models. And role models come in a lot of different forms. Role models and mentors, uh, they, they come in lots of different forms. I think the younger you are, the honestly, the, the easier it is to find a role model in your life, right? To find a mentor in, in your life. But we have to be proactive at finding that, to look for that. And then to go up to them and ask them, who invest in me? Would you spend time with me? I want to learn from you. Um, so in a youth group, oftentimes that kind of, that, that relationship is built in because you're put into small groups and you've got a small group leader, which is phenomenal. I think that it, it, is, it, it is one of the best things because all of a sudden you've got a, a mentor, a role model, someone who cares really genuinely about you built in, like it's assigned to you. You, you don't have to go looking for it. But especially for college students and especially for adults, I think it's something that we always have to look for. Um, sometimes that role model or that mentor might even be someone who's younger than you. <gasps> it's true. And, and I think that requires a teachable posture, right? Um, but I think that we always need to be looking for that. Because and, and then while we when we look for that, um, we talk about the things that we're concerned about. And so, me in my life, I, I have a mentor. I have a mentor right now. In fact, he he was living in Chicago. Uh, he was here in Denver, in Colorado. He moved to Chicago, and so for uh, a year and a half, he's been in Chicago. But he just moved back to to Colorado, which I'm I'm so ecstatic about. Um, I had approached him. And, and asked him, hey, will, will you be, uh, will you, will you just meet with me regularly? And, and I, I just, I just want to be around you. I, I want to talk about what's going on in my life. I want to pick your brain about things. And, and I always made it a point to bring questions to him, to bring questions about the things that I'm wrestling with or the things that I'm encountering or the things that, that I, I just can't make sense of. And, and, and he often doesn't have an answer, but just being around him and the way that he approaches things, like I'm learning so much. And I'm, I, I just turned 48 and I still have a mentor. Um, it's funny, I call him a mentor and he, he hates that I call him a mentor because he feels like we co-mentor each other. Uh, he's a white Caucasian man who is from Canada, actually. And um, he, he's in his 60s. He has adult children. And, but he says, Josh, you mentor me. Um, we have this co-mentoring relationship. Because oftentimes he'll bring uh, up questions that he has, especially when it comes to conversations about race, 
uh, about ethnicity uh, and, and what it has to do with scripture. And so I get to talk about that and talk about my my story as a Chinese American uh, growing up with immigrant parents and what, what, what that's like in this this whole world of, of a Chinese church and, and we interact and so we co-mentor each other and this it's this reciprocal relationship. I guarantee you if you find a genuine mentor or role model in your life it becomes a reciprocal relationship. Um, and so that's what I would encourage especially for the adults. Um, you know if, if you have if you're working with a teen and this teen is struggling with uh, uh, the, the things with their parents and you don't know how, how, how am I how, how do I how do I serve this teen? How do I love this teen? To be able to have someone to turn around and have someone to talk and to say, hey, I've got this teen and, and explain the situation and, and, and maybe gather some insight. And, and, and uh, I think that that is a way to be a miracle girl. Because I, I think that the things that we do never exist in, in a vacuum. So I want to encourage that both for our old as well as our young, uh, our, our youth here whether you're in middle school, especially if you're headed to college. When I was in college, uh, my mentor was actually a, a junior in college um, who was, became my small group leader. And man, the, the time and space that he poured into me was incredible and really shaped me and helped me, especially my freshman year. Um, you know, eventually he, he left, um, it, you know, he graduated and left, and and I became the junior and senior. And I I was mentoring guys, freshmen and sophomores under under me, but I realized I needed to find a mentor. Uh, and so at the church that I was attending to, I, I attending and 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 a part of, I went up to a guy who he was a worship leader actually, and I said, hey, would you mind if we met like once a month? And, and I just need to be around somebody who uh, I can learn from. And, and I, I really want to learn from you. Um, and I would always just be intentional in bringing questions and, and, bringing, and bringing situations so that we have something to talk about. Like, it, it's not up to the mentor to talk about things. But instead, I'm bringing things that I want to talk about and I want to pick his brain about and I want to ask him about. So that's, that's my encouragement for everybody here. Um, I think that's all the time that we have, right? Uh, somebody help me here. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we are out of time for this topic. Uh, so thank you so much to Pastor Josh for uh, being willing to open up this morning and share with us about you know, what it means to take ownership of your faith. Uh, so we're going to take a short break. It's not going to be as long as it was going to be originally. So probably a conversation after a short break. Um, yeah, we're now back and uh, about to discuss growing out in Christ and how to partner with the poor and other communities around us. Um, and our speaker, Pastor Josh, is willing to open up this morning to, to, to share that with us. So thank you, Pastor Josh. Oh, so I'm on, that's it, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the topic of growing out in Christ, um, really wanted to talk about what it means to serve others in a, a, a particular context, a particular, um, in a particular way. Um, I grew up in a Chinese church and I served at Chinese churches and which by the way, the, the bio um, is a little off um, in my introduction. I am no longer at a Chinese church. Um, I, I, I left the Chinese church uh, that I was serving at. I served there for nine years and I left just last September. So it's almost been a year uh, that, that, that I exited the church. Um, and, but at Chinese churches, uh, and, and this is one of the driving factors of why I exited the Chinese church, um, a lot of Chinese churches really struggle with serving outside of the Chinese community. Um, there's sometimes just so much ethnocentrism that the focus is just with Chinese people and that it becomes really insular. Um, but as I have continued to spend time in scripture and sitting with what God uh, says, this is what life is supposed to be, as God has continued to like do a work in me, uh, I've, I've found that I, I need to sit with people who are completely different from me, who are in a completely different situation because um, because in those spaces, it's 
I learn so much. I'm shaped so much by it. Um, and, and my view and perspective of God broadens. It gets bigger because of it. And so one of the places, <clears throat> one of the places that Scripture always, uh, over and over and over again, talks about is serving the poor. Um, and so as a family, we had to... Yeah. Um, all right, hi, whoever is um, yeah, not speaking, could you please go on mute, please? They got it. Um, so so we, we chose to uh, serve the poor. And the more and more as a family that we did this, uh, both my wife, my wife is actually a big driver of, uh, of that value in our family. Um, the more we started to see a, a, a divide in terms of trajectory, um, that the Chinese church is a totally perfectly valid and good trajectory. Serve the Chinese community uh, is here where we are in Denver, um, just like in, in Naperville. But we realized that our, our life and ministry started to become more and more outside of the Chinese uh, community. Uh, and really into this neighborhood that we live in. We live in a pretty unique neighborhood. Um, it was the old airport that was uh, renovated. Like they, they moved the airport way out uh, side of the city and then they renovated this, this area uh, to, be, to be kind of a multi-use place. And so it's pretty close into the city. We're about 15 minutes from downtown. And um, it's, it's both really affluent and really not. Um, so it's a really strange space that we feel very privileged to live in. Uh, I can walk a couple of blocks and the part of town that I'm in, all of a sudden it changes because it used to be right up against the airport. And so it's really low income housing that exists there. Um, just maybe a mile away, um, notoriously used to be like the the roughest area of, of Denver. It's not anymore. Um, the there was a big medical campus that moved in. Uh, the university kind of bought all this property and land and developed it. And and so the the neighborhood has slowly changed and and it's no longer at that dangerous. It, it never was like Chicago. There are neighborhoods in Chicago that are far far scarier. But, um, but it still has this weird mix. It's right in this in-between space where there's a lot of development going on, there's gentrification going on, but there's still a lot of residents who have been here for decades upon decades. And so we get to live in this um, strange mix of a neighborhood. And so we've been spending a lot of time um, serving this neighborhood. So I, that's why I got involved in serving uh, our neighborhood school, wanting to be involved in our community. So I started in serving at a, at a charter school, serving at, as a board member of a charter school, getting to know people in the neighborhood. We started to attend uh, public hearings uh, in the neighborhood. We started to, um, uh, we started to um, go to all the meetings that uh, the city council members or the, the U.S. representative would, would hold so that and we would show up the, when the mayor would hold um, like open open town hall discussions. We would show up there as well. And, and we just started to get to know people and get involved in their neighborhood. Um, and along the way, we got to encounter uh, the poor, um, people who really struggle financially. There is something incredible about sitting with the poor because uh, the the things that they struggle with are they really puts me to shame you know oftentimes the the major things i'm worried about are just really their 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 first world problems right oh man my kid i want him to go to this school and 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 he, he's on the wait list or or oh i, I have a I, uh, I, I really need to take my car for a car wash because it looks so dingy and everything like that. Though those, those are kind of concerns of, of the first world. But those who struggle with um, income insecurity, food insecurity, uh, they struggle in a whole different realm. And what I realized 
is that when I get a chance to sit with them, it's not about what I get to do or give, um, but instead I have so much to learn. I, I have so much to grow from. Okay, so I, I wanna ask this question and, and I don't know if we'll interact with it or not, but I wanna ask the question, okay, when you think of poverty, um, what, are the, what are the top words that come to your mind? When you think of poverty, what what are the top words or phrases that come to mind? And here I'll, I'll do this. Uh, um, type them into the the little chat box if you want. Uh, I I hope the chat is still open. So uh, think of when you think of the word poverty, what do you think of? Um, what comes to mind uh, in your in your brain? So yeah, poor. Lack of stable housing, healthy uh, lack of healthy food, homeless definitely. What else comes to mind? Uh, what do you think of? Lack of good health care. That's a really good one. Uh, struggles. Um, yeah. Anything else? All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna toss. So I do have a little bit of a presentation. So I'm gonna toss this on the screen. Let me see if I can uh, make it look a little bit pretty. Oh no, that's not right. Sorry. Um, let me make it look a little prettier. There we go. Okay. Um. Oh, it failed to start. Hang on. Screen sharing failed to start. Let me try again. All right, there we go. All right. And so oftentimes when we think about poverty, um, you know, the, the U.S. here, uh, especially in the West, we tend to see poverty as a lack of material possessions or a lack of access to things, right? Poor people, um, so... Poverty is thought of, oh, there, there's homelessness. They don't have a place to live or they, 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 they don't have food, uh, enough food. They don't have enough clothes. They don't have enough uh, health care. They don't have uh, access uh, uh, to, to the things that we, we have. But if you talk to poor people, poor people actually typically talk about their poverty in terms of shame, inferiority, powerlessness, humiliation, fear, hopelessness, depression, social isolation, voicelessness. And I think that's really a significant distinction. You know, I'm coming from a background I have. I have stuff. And so when I think about the poor, when I think about those in poverty, um, I think about the fact that they don't have those things that I have. But when the poor refer to themselves, they talk about they talk about struggling with identity, about shame, about 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 feeling like they have no power uh, to and, and and their lives are out of control. They talk about feeling humiliated by other people, put down by other people. They they struggle with depression. And, and, and fear, fear about where they're going to sleep, fear about their safety, fear about being able to survive. And I think that uh, I think that's a remarkable distinction uh, because because here, let me share this next next screen. Um, because if we believe that the primary cause of poverty is because people don't don't have enough education. Uh, they don't have enough knowledge. If they had more knowledge, then then they would be they wouldn't be poor, right? Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to approach the the problem to just educate them. Okay, let's focus on education and let's like lift them up out out, out of that because by educating the uh, the this group. If we believe that the primary cause of poverty is is um, is because they are pushed down by the system, by, by people who are taking advantage of them, then we're gonna work towards social justice and bring them justice uh, that, that what is unfair about the systems, what is unfair about people who are in power and how they treat uh, those who don't have, uh, like we're gonna fight against that. If we believe that, um, we believe that the primary cause of poverty is it's their fault, 
right? It's because of their sin. It's because of their poor choices. It's because of, of the things that, they, that they've done. Then what we're going to do is we're going to try to evangelize them. and We're trying to disciple them and teach them like how to make different choices. If we think that it's all about uh, the lack of material resources, that they don't have a house and a home, or they don't have uh, they don't have clothes, they don't have they, they have all these needs, they don't have enough food, then all we're going to do is bring all of those things, clothes and food, and provide them housing. Okay? And that's oftentimes how what we do in terms of approaching uh, the poor, but. The real cause of poverty is all about broken relationships. There are broken relationships all around. And that's what I've learned about um, getting an opportunity to sit with the poor. Um, that their poverty comes from broken relationships. Broken relationships maybe with themselves. There's a complexity of their self-esteem or their identity um or maybe there is arrogance like like what we mentioned in the last workshop uh, uh, there, there's a brokenness to their relationship with themselves they might have a broken relationship with other people um it causes self-centeredness uh it, it causes them to to make poor choices in, in relationship maybe they have a broken relationship with creation uh, creation itself and that causes them to lose a sense of purpose in terms of work. And it causes them to make poor choices there uh, in dealing with the all of creation. Uh, it causes materialism. Or maybe it's a broken relationship with God. And that is all about sin, suffering, right? Uh, there are all, also other factors that, that contribute to to poverty, there's political systems, economic systems, social systems, even uh, religious systems. But poverty is all about relationships that don't work, that aren't about life, that aren't that aren't enjoyable at all. Poverty, at the heart of it, is the absence of uh, this ancient understanding of shalom. Uh, if you've ever heard your small group leader or or Pastor Barry. Uh, talk about shalom, uh, it, it translates as a word peace. But oftentimes when we use the word peace, we think about it as an absence of conflict, right? That we want peace in the Middle East. Um, we want the, 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 the absence of conflict. Peace in scripture isn't about, uh, isn't about the absence of conflict. It's about the presence of something that brings wholeness. It's about, you know, think about it like a, a, a cracked jar. And all the cracks in the jar, uh, peace or shalom is about the presence that fills in those cracks and you're made whole again. And actually that's the illustration that, that the Apostle Paul often, uh, he, he, he actually uses for himself. He calls himself, we're all jars of clay. We're all fragile, broken pieces of pottery that... Uh, the presence of God comes and fills in those gaps and cracks. And that's why in my weakness, there's actually strength because it's not my strength. It's, it's God's strength shining through those cracks, filling those cracks. Um, at the heart of it, poverty is all about um, the loss of wholeness, of shalom. What happens is uh, we, we sometimes unintentionally reduce poor people to objects or projects somehow to fulfill our own like need to accomplish something and so when we serve the poor we we go and they become a project for us right oh let's collect all of these like clothes uh, we'll, we'll do a clothes drive and and we're going to collect all this clothing and then we're going to go turn around and we're going to give all this clothing to, to to the poor which is okay this that's okay but it doesn't solve the heart of the problem, right? It doesn't uh, address the broken, broken relationships in their lives. Um, so we're trying to meet this need that is only a symptom of a deeper problem. And so until we embrace, um, in, until we embrace not just their brokenness, but even our brokenness, sometimes when we work with uh, people who are coming from low income, 
places, uh, people who are struggling with poverty, we end up doing more harm than good. Uh, we end up creating a dependency, uh, a paternalism. Um, we, we, end up, we end up creating this system where they're dependent on us. So one of the things that uh, ever since COVID has happened, um, my, my wife, Tina, and I, we, we've taken it upon ourselves to really care for some of the families from our school. In our school, we have an international population. Uh, there, Denver used to be a major uh, refugee settlement um, location. It's no longer that because with our current political system and administration, refugee, uh, refugees coming into the U.S. has just like uh, the spigot has turned completely off. Um, there's not even drops. Um, and so there aren't any new refugee set, uh, refugees who are coming into our country that are uh, being resettled. Um, if you know anything about this population of refugees, all of them have been chased out of their own country, their own homes, for one reason or another. Usually it's because of conflict, because of war. Uh, sometimes for some of them, it's because of genocide, uh, that they're, they are actually targeted by people to just be wiped out. And so they fled to different countries and different places to try to find safety. But what ends up happening is they are collected because they're not really immigrating into those countries illegally. They're collected into these camps, refugee camps. And they have to stay at these camps for a couple of years um, while they're waiting for the world to open their doors to allow them to enter into another country to be resettled. And that's, that's what's happened, like that's this community. So Tina and I, we get to uh, have contact with people from uh, countries like Eritrea, from Myanmar. Uh, we, have, we come in contact from Myanmar, lots of people groups like Burmese, uh, Karin, which is a, a minority ethnic group that was really attacked um, by the, the majority culture, of the majority ethnicity, they're a different ethnic group. Um, and they were attacked for, um, for ethnic cleansing. Uh, and then even Rohingya. So more, more recently, uh, uh, I've gotten a chance to sit in uh, the living rooms of some Rohingya who, um, they were the most recent people group who, uh, of ethnic cleansing from Myanmar. Uh, we get to sit with people from Sudan, uh, from Syria, from uh, Ethiopia, and and all of them have these incredible stories, um, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching stories. They're coming into our country with nothing at all, literally nothing. They, 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 they're given clothes because they, they had to flee their homes with, some of them fled their homes in underwear. Like well, that, that was one story that we got. And so all the clothes that he was wearing, he was given. Like he had nothing. Um, and they're resettled in the U.S. with the hopes that they could make a, a new home here. Uh, but I have to say, it's, it's tough uh, here in the U.S. The kind of jobs that they can get, especially not knowing any English, um, there's only a certain strata of, of, of jobs and income that they can make. Um, the, the U.S. government leans on really other organizations, especially faith-based organizations to help these families kind of get on, on their feet. So um, these faith-based organizations will place them into apartment complexes. Actually, one apartment complex is, was bought by the Lutheran Church specifically to place refugees there um, and to house them. And that's the apartment complex that is close by that we get to, to work with. Um, being in those places, I realize that they definitely are experiencing poverty, but there's such richness about their perspective of life, about their approach, about their values, about what's really important and what's not. And being around them, I realize, man, I have so much to learn from them. Oftentimes, churches especially, will try to uh, externally have a, a place of ministry to serve. They'll, they'll go to a soup kitchen or, 
or they'll collect, do a clothing drive and, and it becomes a project. But I think that as a church, we need to change our perspective. That the poor, Jesus constantly said, the poor you're always going to have. And, and again 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 in scripture that, that we're supposed to care for the poor. We're supposed to take, uh, take good care of the poor. We're, we're supposed to sit with the poor. And that's what Jesus often did. He sat with the lowest of society. He, sat, he, he even went and touched people who were considered unclean. The poorest of the poor. Um, and as I've learned to do the same thing that Jesus did, uh, I realize that it is shaping who I am. Uh, so I've tried to learn how to love the poor without making them objects or project. They're not, they're not people to just uh, throw goods at or even throw money at. Um, oftentimes, that's the solution that we in the West have towards this issue of poverty. Uh, they become projects where you raise a bunch of money and you throw money at the problem. Um, but instead, to see them really as the image of God, created wonderfully, fearfully made people who are treasured and valued by God. And so I've gotten a chance to be invited into their homes and sit with them and just listen to their stories. Um, I started to learn this because I made friends with a guy who here in Denver, when I first moved here, um, he runs this coffee shop and it's a unique coffee shop. Uh, it's called Network Coffee Shop. And um, if you do a search for Network Coffee Shop in Denver, you can you can see their website. It's, it's a space where um, they offer free coffee for anyone. And it's not very good coffee. It's like bulk coffee, it's, 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 it's not great. And, and there's not real cream and, uh, or anything. Um, it's not like a, a, a frou-frou, fancy Starbucks kind of latte kind of place. But what it is, is it's a place to restore humanity. In this coffee shop, all, all its principle is, is this is a place where homeless are welcome to come. Those who are uh, struggling with poverty, they're welcome to come and have a place of belonging here in this place. And so, um, because most often, like if you go to a McDonald's or if you go to, um, if you go to, to, to any other coffee shop or, or places, uh, people who are struggling with poverty, especially the homeless, they're not welcome in those places. They get kicked out of those places, which again, that's why that's why those who struggle with poverty struggle with self-esteem. They struggle with depression. They struggle with powerlessness, right? They don't have a place of belonging. So, so what Net Network Coffee Shop, uh, the, what, what they try to do and what my friend Ryan tries to create as an environment is this is a welcoming place. But what Ryan also does is he goes to places, churches, um, like like our church. He came in and I got to, a chance to meet him and he just invites us to come not to bring food, not to bring clothes, not to provide coffee or anything. He just wants us to actually go to that coffee shop and have coffee with all of these people who are struggling in poverty, to have conversations with them, to listen to their stories, for them to listen to our stories and to, to connect in a, in a relational way. So I started to do that my very first year here in Denver, and I realized that the ways that I've always approached ministry, especially to the poor, has been completely wrong. It's been everything that, that I've described before. I got a chance to sit with people regularly, and I tried to go as regular as possible because the more regular that I was, the more I saw the same people and learned their names and heard their stories and a friendship could actually be built. Um, all these guys who were in the coffee shop, they weren't, they weren't interested in me giving them anything. They just wanted good conversation and to be treated fully human. Um, that's what started my road in learning how to sit with the poor. Um, 
and how much I had to learn from them. Uh, and so, yes, there is a need to provide help when uh, they need help. Um, but there are only certain situations that that's true. Uh, so I'm going to throw this slide on and then I'm going to try to be quiet and um, field any questions, which I don't, I, I've just gone on too long, so I apologize. But, but let me just show, show this uh, slide. And this uh, comes from uh, a great, oh, sorry, uh, a great study that I got to do uh, called When Helping Hurts. Um, the, the kind of undergirding theory is we don't want to help those who are struggling in poverty uh, by creating a paternalism. And so there are certain times that is appropriate to help with financial and physical needs. Um, and, and I keep doing that, sorry. Darn mouse. Okay. I did it again. Okay. Ah! Okay. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, the annotating doesn't show up. Okay. So if you see the person, that's per someone who is just going on in life, and then you see the lightning bolt that crashes in, and that means like some traumatic, tragic thing has happened. And it ranges the whole gam gamut of things. Maybe it might be uh, a struggle with mental health, or it might be they lose their job, or it could be that a natural disaster happens and uh, they're, they're, the roof of their house caves in. Um, you know, we, we've seen this all around the world. A, a typhoon comes in and wipes out and decimates the place. Or uh, right now, there's uh, hurricanes that are uh, people are really concerned about, uh, like bearing down on the Bahamas that are still struggling in, uh, in recovery from last year's uh, hurricanes. Uh, there's a hurricane headed toward Hawaii right now. And so, so that's that lightning bolt. Something happens. Maybe it's a natural disaster. Maybe it's their own choices. Uh, they, they make some real poor choices. Maybe, maybe it, it, it's something that then they are in desperate need. They're in a hole. And at that point, um, we who have, we who are blessed, we do need a help. And that is relief. Um, that's what the Red Cross does. That's what uh, 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 Samaritan's Purse does. They, this is, they come into those emergency situations and they provide relief. They provide shelter. The, that's what FEMA does here in the U.S., right? When, when hurricanes hit uh, New Orleans or, or uh, Florida, they, they will come in. They'll put up tent shelters. They'll provide medical. They, they'll provide meals. Uh, that's relief, and that's so desperately needed. But after a period of time, those of us who want to help, we need to change our mindset. That we need to no longer provide relief, but then begin to provide rehabilitation. To work so that people can get back on their feet. To return them back to independence. Which really requires a lot of work and a lot of uh, a different mindset. And this is the space where relationship really needs to happen. This is the space of re restoration of the soul, of the, all of those broken relationships, whether it's a broken relationship with um, creation, broken relationship with self, broken relationship with others, or even a broken relationship with God. Relief isn't the time and space for that which I've seen happen. You know, I, I've watched someone who lost their job and was newly a homeless and people all of a sudden, like their, their guy I, on the street, I've watched guys go up and, oh, well, you, let me share with you the gospel, which the person listening is like, okay, I, Jesus is nice and everything, but that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. And that's why relief is so necessary, and it's all about meeting those needs, those physical needs. But in that space of rehabilitation, that's when we begin to reach the soul. That's when we can talk about God and, and, and a restoration of a relationship with God, or, or, or talk about relationships and restoration of, um, of, of people in their lives. And what we hope is that it would lift them 
into independence so that they can get back on their feet again, right? Uh, so that they can stand on their two feet, they, they can be able to get a job, they can be able to uh, have a home, pay rent, pay the bills, uh, they, they would understand how to save, um, you know, that, that's all a part of rehabilitation. And that never happens in a vacuum. Because again, you've got to reach the heart before any of those things begin to change. And so there are a couple of... Uh, couple of ministries around that I get to work with um, that are incredible. Uh, one here is called Mile High Workshop. Uh, and what they do is they provide stable employment. That is part of their mission statement. We provide stable employment. It's minimum wage, but it's stable employment. And it's an easy, easy entry point. It's, it's manual labor. Uh, it's just like uh, packaging boxes and, and getting them ready for stores. Or, and, and it's a self-sustaining ministry. So it's not a uh, 501c3. Uh, it's not a nonprofit. It's a for-profit business. But the whole point of profit is to provide employment. So they take all the profit and they put it back into the company so that it, would, it could provide more and more jobs. And what they do is some of the some of the um, um, some of the employees are there to provide that relational connection and to provide that uh, a kind of a mentorship to see what's going on in life. Uh, and, and, and so um, a lot of the people who work there, they're struggling with addiction. They're coming out of addiction or they're coming out of incarceration. They're coming out of prison. Um, they're coming out of broken homes. They're coming out of homelessness. Um, and so the managers there aren't there just to provide, um, you know, to make sure that people are doing their jobs. They're actually there to invest in these people and to see, hey, what are the broken places in your life? And let's start walking together to figure out how to bring shalom, how to restore wholeness. So the stable employment provides kind of a base and they begin to work on the soul so that eventually, and they've had uh, a number of success stories, um, eventually some of these individuals get into a healthy space where they actually say, hey, I want to look for a new job. And so this company then provides job training, uh, provides, you know, they actually buy a suit or, you know, work clothes for them to be able to interview and provide it to them and, and, and uh, you know, give them tips about interviewing. Because the point isn't to always forever work at their company, Mile High Workshop, but actually to go get better jobs um, to be able to lift themselves up. It's all about rehabilitation. Um, and beyond that, it's about development. When you get people up on their feet, you want to continue this trajectory where they're growing getting them connected to a community where they belong, getting them in, uh, into, into not just a job, but maybe a career, something that they want to do, getting them to a place where they can begin to dream and hope. They can begin to wonder, hey, you know, I really love, you know, uh, these things, even though I'm doing some manual labor, I, I really, I'm really interested in in, in um, languages, and I really lo love learning new languages and, and, and getting them to invest in those things and, and the things that bring them fulfillment. Or, you know, there's a whole plethora of, of, of things. Like some of them, they end up starting their own businesses, which is great because it's their dream. They've always wanted to. That's the work that we're in. And I want to say, oftentimes, churches, um, when we approach ministry, um, we don't approach it this way. Um, we might only see that relief side, but that's all that we do and we give to people. But I think that real ministry, the ministry that God calls us to is about people and restoring people. Um, so I've talked long enough. Uh, would love to hear any um, questions that people have. Uh, I can share more stories if you'd like. Um, even just this week, I was sitting in the living room of um, a family from Rohingya, and they were asking, hey, uh, do you know of English classes? We want to improve. We, they've been out of work for four months, um, trying to look for work. We 
uh, have been navigating websites, uh, applying for unemployment for them, applying for housing assistance, uh, 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 food stamps, and um, and in the process, like they've reached a point where the relief has given them a little breathing room where we're talking about uh, rehabilitation. They're actually interested themselves in learning English, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, how do you get an address for the homeless when they apply for jobs? That is a great question. Um, one of the things that we found is that we have to partner with companies so that they would be more willing to hire people that might not have stability. Um, part of the work of relief is to provide stable housing, um, a place where they can be able to uh, say, hey, this is my address. So one of the organizations that I get to work with here in town is actually a Catholic or organization. They allow anyone and everyone. So they, they provide housing, um, subsidized housing, for people, as some of them are completely free housing, to get people out of relief into rehabilitation. And so providing that housing, they also say, uh, they also provide anyone, regardless if they're staying in their housing or not, they are allowed to use them as their permanent address so that when they get their license, when they, when they, um, when they apply for jobs, when they get their checks, um, even a lot of uh, veterans will use their address so that their veterans check comes to this address and they hold it for them and these people come and pick up their mail, mail pick up things. And so there are organizations out there that provide that. But you know, that, that is such a great question, Henry. Like uh, um, it's, it's, it's such a desperate need. And I think that that's a space that churches could really, if, if thoughtfully, think through, hey, how, how can we provide that for people? Uh, because all they need sometimes is an address in order to apply for jobs. So that's a great question. And, and at least here in Denver, that has been a, a phenomenal resource. Um, with a lot of the refugee community that I get to work with, they do have their own housing uh, that was provided initially when they uh, landed here in the US. They have to pay rent, it's subsidized and everything, and they struggle with making rent, but they do have housing. Um, yeah, any other questions? So you can unmute as well if you want. Um, I, I wanted to talk about this because this is an outlet of ministry, and I think this is part of maturing in Christ where we begin to see outside of ourselves. Oftentimes when it comes to church, we become so insular and we're looking inwards, in, inwardly. But I don't think that that's what God intended for church. God intended for church to be outwardly looking. We exist as the hope of the world to, to bring and breathe life into the world around us. And yes, we, got, we have a lot of mess to deal with, but kind of like that bathtub illustration that I shared, we, we don't have to get everything right before we start to look outwardly and before we start to pour ourselves outward. Uh, and I hope that Living Water would have an outlet of ministry, that ECHO or OYG, you guys would, would have outlets of ministry. Um, I, I don't see any questions, so I'm just gonna keep talking until there are some questions. Um, um, when so i talked about kind of the the car day that was a creative effort of uh, an outlet of ministry and i hope that as an english congregation echo collectively there would be some thoughtfulness about how we can bring our gifted gifts how we can bring our advantages how we can bring the the things that god has blessed us with and start to bless other people in some way and not just to bless them in relief but to build relationship so that we can bring rehabilitation, we can bring restoration of shalom, of relationship, uh, relationship with God, relationship with others, relationship with self. Um, but even OIG, so I don't know if this still exists, but one of the things that um, I, we tried to do as a youth group when I was there in, in, in Naperville, um, we tried to encourage our teens to, uh, to do ministry in their schools. 
uh, to be involved in their schools. Uh, one group uh, started a, a, a Christian Bible study in, in their school, but it was just a space of worship and centering, and it was open to everyone. And a lot of people who weren't Christians liked to come because um, they, they enjoyed music, but they enjoyed these people who were so genuine, who wanted to center their lives um, so that when it comes to a, a school week, um, they, they weren't running ragged. Uh, so on Wednesday morning, they would gather and they would sing, they would pray, they would hear uh, a devotional. But the whole reason why was kind of the theory of, of new mercies every day, that that was a space where they can gather new mercy in the middle of the week at school so that they could dole out mercy throughout their, their school day. Um, and it became this great, beautiful place um, in the school. Um, yes, that is the model that I've been describing. Um, yeah, that, that God is a, something that we talk about once we have trust and relationship. Uh, talking about kingdom after we, we live out kingdom, right? Um, so I hope that the youth group would think through what are some ways that we can serve, um, that we can love people. There was a, a one team wanted to pack, uh, he, he decided, hey, we're going to pack uh, sack lunches. We're going to make peanut butter jelly sandwiches and uh, stuff, uh, a brown paper bag with stuff like socks and things like that. And we're just going to go and go to homeless. And, and yes, we're, we're providing something. But the point of it is so that we can have relationship, we can have conversation. Um, so always to ask the homeless, hey, what's your name? You know, when you ask someone what their name is, that's a significant thing because you are seeing them as a person, as a human being, you're restoring humanity to them. And then when you ask, when you ask them about their story, hey, tell me your story, you know, like what, 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 what's going on in your life? Uh, uh, all of a sudden, they, they get to share really themselves. Um, and that's an act of restoration of humanity, uh, creating a place of belonging, and maybe some relationship and friendship. Um, what do outreach events look, at, look like at your church? So I'm at a different church now, and um, I'm, I'm not on their staff, but I am a part of their leadership team. Uh, and we are a part of this church because well, kind of two things. So um, the, the Chinese church that I was a part of, uh, they actually, the building was in the wrong part of town. Not because it's the wrong part of town, but because um, the Chinese community didn't live around it. Uh, in fact, every, I lived next to the church building, uh, but everyone else drove at least 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes to get to the church building. And I really felt like like most of them live south. And, and I was trying to encourage the church, hey, you, we, we've got to move the building. Um, because the, the, where we gather to worship needs to be in the community that we live. Um, and, and most of the Chinese live south. And there's some great spaces that the church building could be at to more effectively serve the Chinese community. But because the building was way up north, half an hour north, some people were driving like 45 minutes to 50 minutes just to come and uh, attend worship. And so throughout the week, they wouldn't come to the church building because it's just so far away. And between that and traffic, like no one would show up. And, and, and so, and, and if we were to do ministry out of this building, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, the church is still struggling with that, but with that struggle like is the hard reality that when you are an immigrant population um there's you know the immigrant population survivalism is is, is a big priority right when 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 your first language is mandarin or cantonese or taiwanese or or whatever it is um and your your english isn't very good survivalism is always on your mind and when survivalism is on your mind it's really hard for you to think outwardly, to think about serving others. Um, so I, I, I don't, there's no, there's no blame at this church, uh, at the Chinese church at all. 
but there was a difficulty. What I saw was that my life and my trajectory of ministry was beginning to depart from this particular Chinese church. My hope was that this Chinese church could grow to the point where we would have the same trajectory. But in reality, for that to happen, they need to move. They need to be in, you know, they need to worship where they live. Um, and, and, and I live next to the church building. Um, so that's why I parted ways. Um, the church that I'm at now, uh, so there are two things. One, a lot of people in the church community that I'm in now, their vocation is their ministry. Some of them are business people and that's their vocation, but that's also their ministry, their coworkers, the, the people around them, they invite them over and, and everything. Some of them, their vocation is working with the poor. Um, there's a school that a lot of church members are a part of. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it, it's described as a school of last resort. It's a high school for kids who have been kicked out of all the other high schools. Um, it's, a, it, it's the last resort school before uh, the only other op option is to, to pursue a GRE, um, GED, sorry. Um, and so these teens are coming from really rough backgrounds. Um, they've been expelled from their school. They dropped out of their school. Uh, they've got rough home situations. They struggle with poverty, um, uh, not in, in terms of just material goods, but poverty of relationships, poverty of self, self. Uh, and so, um, this school, uh, teaches these kids, they take them in and it's as much about mentorship and loving them and caring for them as it is like trying to teach them and educate them. Um, and so a large portion of our church community are actually teachers from the school. And there are no, like the workshop that I talk about um, who provides stable employment. Like some of those, the the owner of that has is, is a part of our congregation, you know, and, and um, uh, there's actually an adjacent ministry. Uh, it's a, it's a, again, a for-profit business. What they do is they take donations of uh, building materials and they resell it to the public, but they do that in order to provide employment. And I know that Habitat for Humanity does the same thing. They call it the ReStore. But here in Denver, it's, uh, it's just called Bud's Warehouse, and they do that. And, and the owner of that is also a part of our, our community and our congregation. Um, and so we've got people who their ministry is also their vocation. Um, but then we've got a lot of people who their ministry is outside of their vocation. Um, and I think that those are two approaches that, that we do. So outreach events, sometimes they partner with these organizations. So um, uh, the church will provide lunch for this uh, street school, um, high school. Uh, the School of Last Resort is called Denver Street, Street School. Um, sometimes we go in and we'll volunteer at the workshop, the Mile High Workshop, and we will, the only reason why we're there isn't to give things, it isn't to bring things, but we actually work alongside them, like packing boxes. So doing the exact same thing as their job, and we get to work alongside them so that conversation could happen and relationship could be established. You know, I think it takes a lot of creative thinking. A good start for churches is doing things like volunteering at a soup kitchen to, to provide uh, that. But I think as the church matures in thinking about ministry, I hope that it would, it would go the extra step to think, okay, instead of just handing out soup at a soup kitchen, let's come around and sit at the tables with them and eat that same soup and, and, and come and interact with them because there's so much to learn and to grow from. Um, Pastor Josh. The, yeah. Oh, sorry. There, there may have been one question that um, you might have missed from the Chung household. How has COVID impacted the refugees families that you've ministered to and do you foresee future impacts for years to come with the ministry? So, so one of the hard things is that the refugee community here, um, they got wiped by COVID. Um, 
they, the outbreak that happened. So one, their housing is such a, is such close contact. Like families are crammed into apartment buildings and complexes. The apartments are small, and so oftentimes they spill out uh, into just the, the the open balcony areas or walkways and things like that. And and, and they just op live really in full community in the whole apartment complex. Um, and so uh, their jobs are usually manual labor jobs. And sadly, a lot of these companies aren't really concerned about their health protection. And, and so um, one company in particular uh, employs a lot of refugees from that, that I get to work with um, at a meat packing plant. You know, they're just taking meat, cutting it into pieces, packing it together into packages. It's manual labor. But the working conditions were so, they were crammed in there that an outbreak actually happened and the health department had to shut down the company. Um, the company had claimed that they were an essential, uh, a, a essential uh, you know, service, but the health department came and said, you're not protecting your employees. And so this huge outbreak happened. Um, so, and, and a lot of those were from the refugee community. There were, um, there were a lot of hospitalizations and people struggling, still struggling. Um, most of that community have lost their jobs because they are the, the you know, they're the manual labor uh, around. And as different businesses ha had to like take a pause for uh, in hiatus, they, they, they were furloughed or laid off or even fired. Like, um, so most of the companies, like right now, we have some 20 company, uh, tw 20, most of the families, we have some 20 families that uh, we're trying to, as a, who are part of our school. So their kids actually attend our school and that's how we uh, got in contact with them. Uh, and Tina and I are trying to provide weekly groceries. So we're going to uh, our, our school community and we're raising um, you know, funds as well as uh, donations. So our stairway right now, if I took you to our stairway, you would see like there's uh, boxes and cans and, and packages of rice, of tuna, of, of uh, all kinds of things along our stairway because our, our stairway has become kind of a food pantry. But the whole reason why we've done this isn't so that we just bring food. What we've done is we've tried to match up families together. Um, a refugee family who's struggling with poverty, unemployment and everything, and uh, a school family who might be a little bit more affluent. And if they need help in terms of bringing groceries, we provide that from, from this food pantry. But what we hope is that that family then would deliver the groceries to this family so that they would have some face-to-face -face time. It's been hard because um, the refugee community, they don't tend to wear masks. They don't, they don't they're not socially dis, uh, social distancing or anything. And they have had outbreak cases of COVID there. Um, but with the families who have, who, who have been willing to risk, uh, like when Tina and I go into their, their homes, like we're wearing masks and everything, and we, we take precautions, um, but it's still uh, an opportunity of, of relationship and connection. Uh, and it's been really humbling. Um, uh, I think that this community is gonna continue to struggle uh, deeply. You know, a lot of businesses have shuttered and people, um, who lost their jobs because of COVID, thinking that once COVID is over, they can go back to work. Uh, that company doesn't even exist anymore. So I, I think that in, in this coming year, um, we're going to, I think there's going to be a delay in seeing the impact. And so what, um, what some economists are projecting is that 2021 and 2022 may be pretty rough for us. And that's the thing, like in, in, in certain situations like this, like COVID or a recession or even like a natural disaster, like a hurricane, for the rich, it inconveniences us. For those who have, it's an inconvenience. But for the poor, uh, it crushes them. Uh, and I think that that's some of the call. Um, I think that that... In, if we think about that too much, it can be overwhelming. Because I mean, like, how can we provide employment for people, or how can we how can we do these things? Like, it, it can be completely 
uh, overwhelming. And my encouragement is, well, again, the hope is all about rehabilitation to development. Um, and that requires relationship. So maybe for a, a church like Living Water, it might be, hey, what's one family who's in need? Maybe they might not be the bottom of the barrel, kind of uh, struggling and scraping by, but but they are in need. What can we adopt them as a family and give them a place of belonging that they belong with us, and help them in terms of not just providing you know any material housing assistance or groceries or anything, but let's provide them relationships so that maybe we can we can heal some of the soul. Um, you know, that, that's something that I want to encourage. That, that was the whole point of Car Day. We, we use Car Day and everyone's got a car. To, you know, so this isn't poverty like way down below, but, but, but it was people who still were in poverty because they, they were broken relationships. And we, we leveraged that as a platform to, to do ministry. So uh, there's the last one. Uh, Asian immigrant church is ideal for English as a second language classes. Yes. Even for Chinese school classes, not just for kids and for tutoring. And I think that's a phenomenal idea. Here in my neighborhood, um, uh, we have the Asian Pacific um, a Development Center. And they do what I really believe the Chinese church really needed to do. They provide all of those services. Uh, it, but it takes a lot of commitment and a lot of organization. And so I want to say, as a church, if you want to be involved in this kind of work, there's a lot of growing up adulting that needs to happen uh, to take ownership of, of, of a program like this. Uh, so the, the Asian Pacific Development Center, they, they have a wing that provides counseling, free counseling to uh, the Asian community. Uh, they provide food assistance, they provide job training, and they provide English classes, which is a huge thing. Um, especially for this community. And like I said, just this past week, sitting uh, in this family, the Rohingya family's living room, uh, they were asking, hey, we really need to learn English. We want to learn English, which means they're on the pathway to rehabilitation. They're, they're not just in relief anymore. Um, and that was so encouraging. And it was such an exciting moment because we were like, oh, we have a resource. APDC, the Asian Pacific Development Center, they have classes, and right now they're remote classes. And so, hey, do you need a laptop? Because if, if so, we can go find a laptop, uh, that's part of relief, so that you can be re rehabilitated, so that you can learn English, you can participate in the English classes, because they're not meeting in person right now, but they're doing it online, which you can participate in. And so that, that's been what, one, of our, one of our family projects recently. Um, so those, I hope those give you some ideas. And even in a place like Naperville, you know, there's, there are spaces of income inequality, um, even within the church. Even within the Church of Living Water, you've got white collar folks and you've got some folks that you may not know it, but they're really struggling. And, and I hope that the church would start to ask that question, are there people who are in need? It, it's not just, oh, we have this fund, and if you need help, come and ask, but rather to go to people and, and, and because you already have a relationship with them to ask, hey, do you need help? Let's access this fund or let's do, um, uh, let, let, let's do uh, this work of rehabilitation, relief or rehabilitation or even development. Does that make sense? Because in a big church like Living Water, um, there are people who they might be experiencing poverty um, they're broken, broken places of relationship with self, with creation, with God, with others. Uh, yeah. Man, I am way over time, so I apologize. I can just go on and on. Um, yeah, no, no, no worries, uh, Pastor Josh. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us for the second workshop on growing out in Christ and partnering with the poor. I think it was very educational for all of us. Um, so we're going to be taking... A bit of a break now. Um, I think the leaders, um, uh, if you're if you're a leader, a small group leader, or part of